Hello, and welcome to the Washington Post Live. I'm Christina Passariello, Technology Editor at the Washington Post. Thanks for joining us today for our program, The Path Forward, Tech Regulation. My guest this morning is Margrethe Vestier, Executive Vice President of the European Commission. She is one of the world's most influential regulators of big tech companies. Welcome to Washington Post Live, Madam Vice President. It's a pleasure to be with you. How are you today? Oh, great, thanks. We're excited to talk with you this morning. There's so much going on uh, in your areas of interest. So let's start with the news. Um, on Friday, President Biden issued a sweeping executive order aimed at curbing the power of large corporations. For years, it seemed that competition was largely a European issue. Do you feel like you finally have a partner in the Biden administration? You know, I'm, I'm really encouraged uh, by recent events. Uh, I find that this executive order exactly puts uh, a finger on, on something really important, that people in their everyday life should have the benefit of, uh, of competition, a fair competition, having choice, affordable prices, knowing that uh, the market actually serves them in their role as a consumer. Uh, and also, I think that the debates, uh, and some of them, of course, bipartisan uh, in, in your democracy, is, is showing the way. New proposals are being tabled, some of them even more far-reaching uh, than the one we have tabled uh, within the European Union. And I think that the debate is, is really nuanced, it's, it's uh, concrete, and, and it shows the dedication to make sure that we get this open competitive market to make the best of, uh, of digital technology. Absolutely. So you recently met with the new chair of the FTC, Lena Khan. What's your sense of how she's approaching these issues? Well, you know, we have a, a long-standing and very close working relationship uh, with the FTC. And... Uh, and connecting with, with Lena was, uh, was really great uh, because, um, you know, she brings uh, new ideas. She brings, uh, I think, something that is both within the, the tradition of the FTC, but, but also that shows that there is a readiness uh, to push uh, enforcement. And I think in that respect, uh, there is an alignment uh, of thinking uh, between us, uh, hopefully something that will inspire throughout the planet uh, in every democracy. So, you know, last month, a federal judge threw out the FTC's lawsuit against Facebook because the judge said the FTC hadn't provided enough evidence that Facebook has a monopoly over social media. It gave the FTC 30 days to refile, so that means they've got a couple of weeks to amend this lawsuit. What would you, what advice would you give Lena Cotton as she rewrites the lawsuit and addresses this issue of whether Facebook is a monopoly? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not in any position uh, to give advice. Um, what we do uh, here, I can tell what, what I, I'm doing myself, uh, is of course, uh, first and foremost, to have uh, a deep and very fundamental respect of the fact that we live in, in a union built on the rule of law. So the actions of the courts gives us guidance, uh, gives us knowledge about how to, how to deal with things. And in, in these years when I've been working on this, uh, of course, one of the important things is to be very thorough, uh, to be able to prove your cases, but sometimes also to be willing 
um, to look at things with uh, with a fresh pair of eyes. So to to manage the balance between the case law and the fact that market dynamics they are changing as more and more markets becomes digital. Uh, so so that is what what we are doing uh, in in the deepest respect of the fact that sometimes of course we get uh, guidance uh, from the court um, that we then will have to to adjust uh, after, uh, and also sometimes we realize that. Competition law enforcement is not the only uh, way to get a contestable market, which is why we have tabled uh, the Digital Markets Act uh, in order to, to sort of pair regulation and competition law enforcement for the two uh, to help us to get the contestable market that will serve uh, every business uh, in order for them to serve their customers. So just to follow up on that, I mean, do you believe that Facebook does have a mon monopoly in social media? And on, if so, on what basis? Well, it, it very much depends on, on the specific analysis. Uh, and this is why it's so difficult uh, to give any kind of advice to colleagues, because every case is specific. And uh, one of the really sort of um, uh, difficult and demanding parts of any antitrust uh, uh, investigation is to look at the market. What market are we dealing with here? Uh, for instance, in, in the uh, Apple music streaming case, where we find that, of course, you can buy uh, any phone you want, but have you bought a phone? Well, then Apple has a monopoly in sort of the aftermarket of, uh, of the App Store. And as you can hear, this is a very specific definition. And, and that is, you know, the heart of any antitrust case, and it cannot be seen any, as, as anything else but case specific. What we are doing in, in the Digital Markets Act is basically to say, well, having seen now so many anti-competitive behaviors, having done so, so much analysis as to what kind of market power would sometimes make businesses engage in these kind of, of illegal behaviors, we are, you know, objectively with uh, uh, qualitative and quantitative criteria, uh, sort of uh, framing or or defining what is a gatekeeper, what wh which kind of business would hold so much market power that a special responsibility is required. That's a, a somewhat different approach, but it still holds sort of this key that antitrust is really about uh, companies that hold market power, no matter if it's in a specific case or as here uh, in uh, new legislation. I mean, it's such an interesting point that you make about Apple and the way that um, you know that these gatekeepers are defined and how their how their platforms have power at different points in the consumer relationship. Of course, the EU has been going after the tech giants for years, you know, levying billions of dollars in fines, and yet the tech giants are more powerful today than ever. Um, you know, the companies have much deeper pockets than the regulators trying to control them. Do you think that? Have Google, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook gotten too big to regulate? And full disclosure, let me clearly point out that Amazon founder Jeff Bezos privately owns the Washington Post. Well, at least uh, for me, it has been food for thought that um, we just made what we call a sector inquiry. So we look into a full sector uh, to analyze sort of the state of competition in that sector. So we have been looking into the consumer Internet of Things uh, and in particular focusing on, on voice assistance. We had a number of concerns, a risk of anti-competitive uh, behavior. And unfortunately, a number of those concerns were uh, at least sort of primary, primi <laughs> well, was uh, the first conclusions uh, based on, uh, on information from market participants confirmed some of those concerns. And it was the same concerns as we had seen in, in previous competition cases. And, and this is why I think it's really important also to have a legislative approach because uh, competition cases, they are specific, they have their strengths, but I don't think that we can do without sort of sending uh, a very clear message from our democracy that this is how we want really powerful market participants to behave in order for the market to stay con contestable when you have network effects, you know, marginal costs approaching zero, a lot of uh, data privilege, uh, so to speak. And, and I think that is the only way that we can curb it. Of course, I, I would expect that that businesses that has grown up in a democracy 
will we'll of course fully respect the decisions in a democracy. Of course, and but we've seen with instance, um, for instance, with Facebook, you know, with its acquisitions of WhatsApp and Instagram, that it made many years ago, and and the states in the United States, um, attorney generals from those states, just bringing a lawsuit in recent months. Um, you know, many years after Facebook has digested these acquisitions. Um, and that kind of, you know, delayed response to things that happen very quickly in the market um, seems to be a common problem among tech companies that grow and change very quickly. How do you as a regulator try to keep up with the fast pace of change? Um, can you keep up as a regulator with the fast pace of change in technology? Well, at least we stand a much better chance if, um, you know, uh, uh, jurisdictions where you have democracy and, uh, and a strong regulator, if we are aligned, because we do not have a, a global um, competition uh, enforcer, but we have global companies. So the more we are aligned in respect of uh, different market conditions and, and different sort of pieces of legislation from a historical perspective, the more we are aligned, the better chance we have. And one of the things that I find really crucial right now is to make sure that, that people see that the market serves them, that democracy can deliver, that the market serves you as a customer, uh, and that you have a fair chance of building a new business and getting that new business to the market uh, uh, for, for it to be presented to potential customers. And, and I think that is of the essence, that is part of the legitimacy of, um, of a social market economy uh, as we have it. And, and this is why it is, it is not just an isolated competition issue, it's a broader issue to make sure that people find that, that the society in which they live is a society that provides opportunity that provides uh, options to, to invest in, in innovation and to bring that to market. And, and this is why it's so important that with the combination of specific competition enforcement and new legislation, that the market is kept open and contestable. So there were reports last week that the FTC is going to review Amazon's purchase of MGM, which was its second largest acquisition ever. What about Europe? Will you also review the, review the deal? Well, uh, what the FTC is, is planning to do is, is not for me, and, uh, and we have our own uh, work program. As you will know, we are quite busy uh, with the investigations that we have opened already. But do you think you'll review the, the Amazon's purchase of MGM just as a, as a matter of course? Well, you know, in, in, in my job, one of the things that, that I never do is to confirm uh, what we might do in the future or what we will not do in the future. We prefer to, to leave that kind of things open. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, we had former President Trump last week also, you know, had launched a lawsuit against Facebook, Twitter and Google, um, which pointed out the power that technology companies have to control what is said online. I'm wondering, do you think that he has a point about the overreach of companies and how they determine free speech? Well, now it's it's a lawsuit uh, in, in the US, so I will not be the judge of that. But what, what we are thinking is that there is a need for specific uh, regulation to deal with the fact that one thing is that things are obviously illegal, like incitement to violence or exchange of bomb recipes or even worse, child abuse. Um, and then there is a gray zone. And in that gray zone, of course, there is a risk of uh, over removal of people being blocked. And since we will not accept uh, upload filters uh, in, in what is called the Digital Services Act, we are designing uh, a mechanism uh, where people need to be alerted if their post is taken down, being able to complain about it, and if found uh, that there is over removal, to have their post coming back up again. And that is exactly to find another way that for, for this to be murky, uh, sort of uh, with no transparency as to what is actually going on. Because it's really important to, to, to maintain two things at the same time, that what is illegal offline is also illegal online, but if things are not illegal, well, of course they have their place. 
even if some may find that it is hurtful and, and damaging, but if it's not illegal, uh, of course, uh, people have freedom of expression. As you, I'm sure you know, Section 230, which is the U.S.'s Internet Protection Law, has uh, been subject of a lot of debate in um, recent months uh, among lawmakers. Um, you bring up this point about, about content moderation being dealt with on a global level. What kinds of discussions um, are you having with lawmakers in the U.S. about that content moderation issue? Well, uh, recently we have mostly been discussing sort of uh, uh, competition issues uh, because it's it's really specific. Uh, even here within the European Union, uh, you know, the motto of the Union is is united in in diversity, and uh, and we do not regulate on on content. We are trying to have a a uniform sort of pan-European way of dealing with the fact that sometimes things are to be removed uh, which because they are legal and sometimes that leads to over removal and that has to be dealt with but you know even i'm dane uh, even with our swedish neighbors uh, it would be difficult to to define precisely uh, what we find to be illegal hate speech and what is maybe hurtful and, and damaging but not illegal and, and for me, this is really important because it's it's a debate that goes into the core of uh, of your culture and and your democracy, and it's really difficult uh, to define it uh, from the outside. That seems absolutely true. We see we see these companies often struggle with you know the cultural expectations or the cultural context of so many things that are online. I'm, I'm curious, as you think about um, content moderation and, and thinking about, you know, guidelines uh, that would apply broadly for what kind of what kind of content should remain online or should be removed and the role of the companies in applying that. How do you see sort of smaller platforms being able with less resources, being able to enact um, the rules in a way that Facebook and Google would be able to? Well, we would uh, we would apply some sort of um, of asymmetry. So, so the bigger you are, uh, the more outreach you have, the bigger your responsibility. But, but of course, uh, smaller platforms cannot be left completely sort of out of scope uh, because that may create sort of a, a subset, uh, an environment uh, where things could be uh, really dangerous and 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 get out of hand. Um, so here it's important with uh, with the work with trusted flaggers, uh, with transparency uh, as to how things are uh, ongoing, because even if you are sort of a small issue or, or, or medium sized platform, uh, of course, you have a responsibility uh, towards your, your users that that your platform is not being misused. Uh, to nurture things uh, that are illegal uh, offline and would be um, taken down if it was on a bigger platform. Mm -hmm. And what role do you see technology playing in doing that kind of moderation and in, in spotting uh, things that might be hate speech or otherwise illegal? Well, I think it's, it's really important uh, to make the best use of technology. Uh, if you, you if you look at something as as awful uh, as the misuse of children, uh, here you really need uh, technology to be able uh, to, of course, take it down as fast as possible, but also to be able uh, to find the perpetrators uh, and and to to save the children who has been uh, victims uh, of misuse here. Um, and sometimes also, you know, if, if done the right way, uh, technology can be actually less biased uh, than we are as humans. So uh, I think technology will play a huge role in, in enabling this. But for, for, for us, there is a categorical difference between upload filters and then sort of going through what is actually there uh, and then dealing with it. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Facebook, most notably, has tried to self-regulate um, in this domain, most prominently with its decision to ban former President Trump for a couple of years. What do you make of, of Facebook's attempts to self-regulate, and do you think that that model should be extended to other tech companies? 
Well, I think it's it's important that that companies uh, they they take their responsibility. Uh, they have a company culture. They have themselves decided on on the terms and conditions for for the use of uh, of their service. So I think it's it's completely natural uh, that there is a sense of responsibility as to how is our platform being used. But I don't think in a democracy that you can leave it to self regulation um, as such because. What if some refrain from taking this responsibility? Uh, for instance, one of the obligations uh, in the Digital Services Act uh, proposal is that you have to do a sort of systemic a risk assessment. Is there a risk that my platform can be used uh, to undermine democracy, to uh, obscure uh, election processes? And if I find that those risks are present, how will I mitigate those? Uh, and that sort of plays with sort of the sense of own responsibility, but also making sure that people can rely on businesses having done their homework uh, to make sure that their platforms serves, you know, uh, legitimate purposes and cannot be captured uh, and misused for, uh, for things that would undermine our democracy. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about taxes. Uh, you fought for many years to have tech giants pay more in taxes. And one of your projects is a new digital tax that you just today um, delayed until October. The US opposes the deal, especially since a global tax deal was just reached earlier this month. Um, and I think you're due to meet with uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen tomorrow. What will you discuss with her about the digital tax? Well, I think the, the most important thing right now uh, is, of course, to get uh, the final approval of the OECD uh, agreement um, that uh, taxing rights uh, can be redistributed uh, in order for taxes being paid where value is being created uh, as the first thing. Second, that there is an effective floor uh, on the corporate taxation so that effectively it's a, it's a minimum of 15%. Uh, because these are really important steps. Uh, they are much bigger than what has been achieved for, for decades. So, so that, of course, should be implemented. We th then have a, a sort of a purely European uh, discussion about a, a digital levy uh, that has nothing to do with sort of the perspective of, uh, of these OECD deal because it's for, for many, many more uh, businesses and it's, uh, it's not a levy on uh, a tax on profits. It's more like a levy on turnover, but completely sort of redesigned compared to the digital services tax that was discussed uh, within the union a couple of years ago. Um, because with the digital services taxes, uh, the member states who have uh, designed those uh, they have signaled that with uh, the OECD deal being implemented, they're willing to withdraw. So basically, they are two very different things. Uh, but of course, for us, it's important to make sure that they really remain uh, two different things. So we would like to see the final outcome of the OECD process because we, before we finalize uh, our design. That makes sense. Is can you give us an update on uh, on the timing that you expect for your digital levy tax now that it's been delayed? Well, as I said, we uh, we have delayed until uh, October, uh, and that should allow us to see sort of the final um, the final details uh, of the OECD uh, agreement. Uh, because as I said, we would want this to be two very separate things, uh, and and in order to do so, of course, we need the final details. Uh, but we will keep working on it. It has been a project sort of uh, in the pipeline for quite some time because, as I said, we wanted to, to redesign it from the digital services tax that were discussed a couple of years ago and uh, where there was probably a, a much bigger overlap with uh, the OECD um, discussions. And, and, and for us, it is important uh, that people can see that these are different things. And, and I think no surprise uh, that it's a wise thing to to postpone the launch. So, I mean, these, um, you know, tech companies like Apple and Amazon have long challenged your efforts to get them to pay more taxes in Europe, but they've thrown their support behind this global tax deal from the OECD. Um, are you suspicious of their support for the tax deal? Um, no, actually not, uh, because I see uh, that also for them, it must be uh, much better 
uh, to have the tax issue dealt with rather than to have it, you know, not only sort of warming up, but getting more and more heated uh, as, as part also of, of sort of a brand value. Uh, am I in a company that contributes to the society where I do my business or am I not? So, no, I, I see why they would do this and, and I find that it is important. Um, and of course, I also hope that that will sort of limit uh, future um, endeavors uh, to have sort of more uh, selective uh, tax arrangements uh, with, with jurisdictions that would enable that. Uh, because I, I think it is really needed to show all the many, many businesses, the huge majority of businesses uh, who pay their taxes, that it is not just for the huge majority, it's actually for everyone to contribute uh, to the society where they do their business. You have unveiled some very ambitious proposals to rein in uh, tech giants. What is your vision for how we use technology in the future if your proposals become reality? What will it be like for consumers? Well, I think you'd, you'd see much more uh use of technology you know basically everywhere we see now in in agriculture you see technology in uh, in mobility getting from a to b in in health uh more and more and more technology is being used but i would uh you know do my best to make sure that the citizen the consumer the voter uh feels empowered feels i'm in control i know what is happening with my data I know that when technology is being used, it's not biased. Uh, it, it sees uh, who I am, not my not my gender, not my postal code, uh, not uh, my level of uh, of yearly income. If it's not relevant uh, to these services, and and also I think to some degree because of that, uh, regulation can be market creating. Uh, we have this proposal on on artificial intelligence. Uh, and in, in the use cases where there is a risk of uh, fundamental values being violated, that there needs to be a, a check before it's, it's put on the market. And I think that is one of the things that will create a, a much bigger sort of public sector market. Because then, you know, a mayor can safely say, oh, I will use this artificial intelligence in, in enabling a better service for people who need a, a social subsidy. And I don't fear that this will turn sour uh, because of bias between uh, some citizens uh, in my uh, in my constituency. So, so in that respect, I think uh, regulation can create the necessary trust for us to fully embrace uh, the many opportunities that digital technology brings us. Can you tell us a little bit about your own technology use? Do you use an iPhone? for instance, and if you want to search something up online, do you use Google? How do you apply these thoughts to your own personal technology use? Um, yes, uh, of course, I think I, I, I suffer from the same thing as, as many people do, that I even use my phone as, uh, as my um, um, uh, wake up call. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I, I use my phone a lot. Uh, I use technology a lot. And, and during the pandemic, of course, even more than ever, because it was for, for entertainment, for shopping, for keeping in touch with people, for exercising. Um, but I try to, you know, broaden my view uh, to be curious about other search engines, about other types of maps, other types of weather apps, uh, other types of shopping opportunities, uh, because I think that the, the, the tech market, the tech community has so much more to offer uh, than what we see if we just, you know, lock in on, uh, on what is sort of out of the box experience. Absolutely. Do you have any tips for consumers, um, for other, you know, users of technology? Uh, about how to find those kinds of options, because you're right. Often we we default to to the biggest uh, the biggest players. Well, I, I, for me, I get the inspiration from from other users. You know, I try to read uh, reviews, uh, ask other people uh, what do you use, um, and and I think it's it's really inspiring to see what other people do. You know, right now I'm in the process. I have this goal for for my 50s to to get to learn to draw, 
to mind trying to figure out what would be the best app to help me uh, learn this skill. And that's really not easy because it's a new thing for me. So I'm trying to figure out, well, what would other people who have accomplished this skill, what would they do? Uh, and I think that's the way to go about it. Also, because when you talk with other people, then you get a different kind of inspiration than when you just get your inspiration in a digital way. Absolutely. Technology is filled with so many opportunities, but also so many big issues to think about. That's all we have time for today. Thank you so much, Margarita Vestier, for joining us. It was a pleasure and thank you very much for doing this. Uh, I think it, uh, it, adds, uh, it adds nuance when you take up these uh, different subjects and, and thank you for your reporting, it's really appreciated. Thank you so much. Please keep watching Washington Post Live tomorrow at 10.15 Eastern when my colleague Karen Tumulty interviews Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo about the Biden administration's infrastructure plan. You can always head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and find more information about upcoming programs. Thanks again for joining us.